am so bored. This is day 7,253 of social distancing and I am reduced to drinking cheap champagne straight out of the bottle. And I wish I could leave my house. I wish I could go walk and outside and have sit on a sidewalk and go to a cafe and have a croissant and pretend. Oh, I wish I was in Paris. That's where I wish I could be right now. Paris. Last time I was in Paris was February 2017. And I went there to research my latest book, which is called Mistress of the Ritz, which is now out in paperback. We went to Paris so I could research this book, which is based on the true story of the real American woman who married a Frenchman and together they ran the famous Hotel Ritz of Paris. And they were there when the Nazis occupied Paris and set up headquarters at the Ritz itself. And what happened after that? Oh, it's just such a good story. I really, I mean, I don't need to tell you, right? You've already read the book. But if you haven't, it's just a really good story of, of Paris and heroism and bravery and espionage and intrigue it all taking place within the walls of the famous Hotel Ritz. And oh, I could only be there again if there was just some way I could just close my eyes and just dream of Paris. And if I could just wake up there. Ooh la la, here I am in Paris, Lafayette, I am here. This is the Ritz, I'm actually at the Ritz, I can't believe it, is it a dream? Now, Paris is one of my favorite cities in the world, and my husband and I have been to Paris many times, but um, we have never stayed at the Ritz before, because my husband and I, we are not Ritz people, we are Marriott Points people. So whenever we've gone to Paris, we've always stayed at Marriott Points, at a very nice Marriott near the Arc de Triomphe. But when I realized I was going to write this book about the Ritz, and this book that in the book, which is a story of a marriage, an amazing marriage between two amazing individuals um, whose marriage was really defined by the war, equal parts um, deceit and passion. I, this was a marriage with three people in it and that third person, that third major character in the book was the Ritz. So I knew that I was going to have to actually stay at the Ritz and explore the Ritz and experience firsthand the fabled luxury and elegance that has been synonymous with the Ritz since 1898 when it opened its doors. So when I told my husband that I was going to write this book and we darn it had to go to Paris for research, he was all for that. However, then I broke a tune that I really felt I needed to stay, we needed to stay at the Ritz. Um, so I showed him the room rates and he looked at them and he said, well is that per week? And then I had to break it to him that it was per night. When I picked him up off the floor, fanned him a little bit, I did go on to explain, this is research, and this would be tax deductible. And we will never have an opportunity like this ever again in our lives. So finally he agreed that we would spend part of the time at the Ritz. And uh, let's go inside. I want to show you this amazing hotel. And here we are. This is the front entrance, the front hallway to the Ritz. It's so beautiful. As you can see, it's like, if you stay here, it truly is like staying in a museum. The tapestries, the artwork, the furniture, the, the rugs, the carpets, everything is museum quality. Um, the Ritz has undergone many transformations throughout the years, ever since it opened. About five years ago, though, they did a major renovation where they actually shut the Ritz down for uh, at least a year. I can't remember, it might've been two years. And it was soon after it opened up again that we got to stay here. Um, so this is the, the, the front hallway. Now, there is no lobby at the Ritz because Caesar Ritz did not want people walking in off the street and taking a load off in his famous hotel. He truly was very protective of the rich and the famous people who stay here who wanted their privacy. So there's no lobby in the Ritz. Um, you don't usually get to just walk in off the street at the Ritz. They're very polite about it, but the doormans are pretty kind of pretty careful about who they let in. But once you get inside, there's this amazing hallway. And as you can see, um, the color, I don't know if you can see, the chairs in the Ritz and everything is this particular blue color. It's a beautiful color. It's called Ritz Blue. 
and that is the color of the chairs and in the carpets and the, the drapes here on this long hallway. And if you go down that way, there was actually two buildings. This whole area um, were originally private mansions. This is on Place Vendome is where the Ritz is. Um, but they eventually, the original Ritz was this part, this building, and then eventually they bought a second mansion and they connected them with a long hallway. So that's the other way. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the Ritz and the man who made it all happen. Let's just go over this way. Oh, so this this is the famous Grand Staircase. Just imagine staying here at the Ritz in the 1920s and the 1930s and you would see people like the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and Coco Chanel and Barbara Hutton and, and Mary Pickford and all these famous celebrities walking up and down the Grand Staircase in all their jewels and their clothes. But then imagine being here during the war when this was taken over by the Nazis, and now all of a sudden, walking up and down the Grand Staircase, Nazi officers, and the swastika hanging everywhere. That's what is so intriguing to me about the history of the Ritz during the war. But before we get to the war, first of all, let me introduce you to Caesar Ritz, whose likeness is right behind me. Caesar Ritz was a Swiss hotelier who was in the hotel business and was working at the fabled Savoy Hotel in London. Um, when he and the chef at the Savoy, a man named Auguste Escoffier, and I just like saying that, Auguste Escoffier, they decided to go into business together and they wanted to open the most luxurious modern hotel in all of Europe. And so in 1898, the two of them got together and they opened the Ritz. And it truly, I think, was and is the most luxurious um, and at the time, modern hotel in all of Europe. It was one of the very first hotels to have electric lighting and in-suite bathrooms. And from the moment it opened its doors, if you lived in Paris, the Ritz was the place where you went to, to see and to be seen in all your finery and to hold private banquets. And then if you were visiting and there was an awful lot of royalty roaming around in Europe in those days, the Ritz was where you would go to um, stay. Oh, look, that's a Ritz cat. Look, they, oh, they have the cutest cats here at the Ritz. Parisian cats. They're so cute. And anyway, if you were visiting royalty, you would stay at the Ritz. Automatically is where you would stay. Um, so Caesar Ritz got his dream and then, and the Ritz became synonymous with luxury. And, you know, we even named the Ritz Cracker after the Ritz during in the, the worst of the depression. And Nabisco was trying to come up with a name for a new cracker. And they thought, well, what will make people feel you know, luxurious and happy during this depression. And they decided, well, let's name our cracker after the Ritz. And obviously, oh, she's just, just playing with all the Ritz mice over there. No, there are no mice at the Ritz. Um, and then, of course, there's a song called Putting on the Ritz. So the Ritz, you know, is, has always become, has become synonymous with the height of luxury. Um, Caesar Ritz died soon after World War I, and his wife, Madame Ritz, um, you know, took over and she lived in a suite of rooms, um, I think on the top floor of the hotel. And then she, of course, she hired people to run the hotel. And in the 1920s, she hired Claude Ozello, who is the hero of my book. He is the Frenchman, decorated World War I hero, whose life's ambition was really to run the Ritz. And he had married our heroine, our mistress of the Ritz, Blanche Ozello, who was an American flapper who'd come over to Paris in the 1920s. And as soon as they got married, basically, Claude got his dream job of running the Ritz. And theirs was a marriage that was very passionate. They loved each other madly, but it was full of also deceit and lies and hurt. Claude was a very typical Frenchman who thought it was okay that he would have a, a regular mistress every week. And Blanche was a typical American woman who did not think that, they, that, that was okay. But she always said the Ritz was really Claude's truest mistress. Um, and so the Ozellos basically moved into a suite of rooms here when Claude got his job. And so Blanche and Claude lived at the Ritz. So Blanche became pals with all the visiting royalty. Um, and things kind of, kind of went along for a while until obviously World War II. In a, uh, June of 1940, France and Paris fell to the Nazis. And that's what really intrigued me and wanted me and made me want to write this book. I didn't realize that the Germans, the invading Germans, the occupying Germans, took over all the luxury hotels in Paris. 
the Ritz being the most luxurious hotel there was, this they wanted to headquarter their high command in all these hotels. So this is where the top Nazi officers stayed in Paris, including Hermann Goering. So if you can imagine Hermann Goering walking up and down these stairs. And the Ritz became this crazy hotbed of intrigue of Nazi officers in one part of the hotel, French paying guests on the other side of the hotel, mainly wealthy Parisians such as Coco Chanel who decided to live up the war in luxury. But many of those uh, guests became occupiers. They kind of decided to throw their lot in with the Nazis. And then you had true patriots like Blanche, like Claude, these people who were forced to live under the same roof with the enemy. Claude and Blanche had no choice but to treat the Nazis as their honored guests because that's what the Nazis wanted. So they had to arrange blank banquets. They had to cater to their every whim. Blanche suddenly found herself not having drinks with uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald in the, in the bar. She was suddenly having to have tea, forced to have tea with Hermann Goering. Yet Blanche had a very, um, a, a secret. She could not afford to let the Nazis know. Both Blanche and Claude hated the Nazis and each of them found a way in their off hours, so to speak. To save their souls, they each got involved with the resistance. And so that's what intrigued me to write this book because there were others at the Ritz, like Blanche and Claude, who, while they were not, when they were not treating the Nazis as their favorite guests, they were off working with the resistance. So the whole hotel was this crazy hotbed of intrigue. Now, when I came here, I knew I was gonna to have to see some of the parts of the hotel that that I couldn't afford to see. I, and I wanted to have a behind the scenes tour. And I have a French publisher that tried to arrange some things for me, it didn't quite work out, but I did get in touch with one of the assistant managers who let me see behind the scenes of the Ritz. And he, let, he took me to places that I would not have been able to see on my own. And one of those is the famous Imperial Suite, the largest suite, the most luxurious suite at the Ritz, which is where Hermann Goering stayed. So let's go see that. O-M-G, this suite. This is just a tiny portion of the several rooms of the Imperial Suite. I mean, it's gilded, you know, with the, with the chandelier, with the fireplaces, with the tapestries, with the beds. It is the most incredible, luxurious suite I have ever seen. Now, I naturally could not afford to stay in this suite, but I did get to see it. I did get to tour it. Um, when I asked my tour guide, who was the concierge at the hotel, questions about what went on here at the Ritz during the war, he honestly, I knew more than he did. Um, the war is something that Parisians still to this day don't really like to talk about. There's a very uncomfortable legacy there, particularly at the Ritz, where even though so much happened here during the war, they don't like to talk about it. So instead of telling me that Hermann Goering had stayed in this suite, Today, this suite is much more famous because this is where Princess Diana and Dodi Al-Fayed had their last meal the night that they tragically died in that horrible car accident in Paris. And this is why this suite is well known today. And actually, I've heard of people who show up at the Ritz thinking there might be some kind of memorial to Diana. There is not. The Ritz is not that kind of a hotel. It's very discreet. Um, but this is, this. they will tell you, this is, this is known now because of Princess Diana. But during the war, this is where Hermann Goering stayed. Prior to the war, this was the, fav the, the favorite suite for most of the really important guests who came to the hotel. Um, for instance, Barbara Hutton, who was the famous American Harris, heiress, probably the most, uh, the richest little girl in the world, they called her, and she married uh, multiple times, Cary Grant, Grant from one of them. But when she came to Paris, this is where she would stay. So the Imperial Suite is, um, I mean, what can I say? I wish I could have stayed in here, but I couldn't. But there's another suite that I got to see as well. And let's go see that. This is the Coco Chanel Suite. Chanel is synonymous with Paris, obviously, and the Ritz. They've, they've named their salon, or their spa, the Chanel Spa. And Coco Chanel, there's a suite named after her, which this is. Uh, Chanel lived at the Ritz, basically, from right before the war until the, till her death. This was her Paris home. 
she had homes outside of Paris, but when she was in Paris, this is where she lived. Not this particular set of rooms, actually, though. The, where she actually lived is a different set of rooms, but they have renamed this particular suite in her honor, and many of the furnishings that were in her rooms are in this suite. Uh, her salon is just right around the corner, so it was very, very convenient for her to live here. And then when the war started, like others who could afford it, I think she figured, well, let me live at the Ritz during the, and I might have a better chance of uh, being able to kind of maybe live out the war in a little bit of luxury. And so she moved into the Ritz. Um, so Paris and the Ritz, very proud of Chanel. When she moved in here, the Ritz, you know, was basically decorated kind of the way it had been ever since the beginning in 1898, with very, but still very luxuriously. But Chanel, being Chanel, had to redec her, redecorate her rooms. So her suite is in a very different style from the rest of the Ritz. It's very art deco, very much in keeping with her most prolific and famous years. So the furnishings and the furniture and even the, the taps in the bathroom and every other bathroom at the Ritz, the taps are gold swans not in the Chanel suite bathroom. They're just very art deco, kind of simple. So let's talk about Chanel. As I depict her in my book, but it's based on truth. Everything that I write, fictionalized, is still based on a lot of truth. We now know that Chanel was definitely an anti-Semite. Um, she very much, during the war years, used the laws that forbade Jewish people from owning businesses. She tried to use those laws to get to kick out her partners in her perfume business, the men who had made her very, very wealthy. Didn't work out. However, uh, she very much was an anti-Semite. And we now know that when she was here at the Ritz and she was sleeping in her bed, she wasn't alone in her bed. She had a high-ranking Nazi, uh, Nazi officer with her, a man named Baron von Dinklage. Yes, Chanel was shacking up with a Nazi during the war. She was at the very least a collaborator. We know this. But now there is evidence in many of the recent biographies written about her that she was in fact a spy for the Nazis. But she's everywhere at the Ritz. Everywhere you go, it's Chanel, Chanel, Chanel. Again, it kind of shows this very interesting legacy that Parisians have. Um, you know, there's, we saw the, the bust of Caesar Ritz, we have Chanel everywhere, but you know there is not one image or one plaque or one mention of Claude or Blanche, Claude or Blanche Ozello, despite the fact that Claude was the longest serving director of the Ritz in its history. But there's no mention of him anywhere. And that is one reason why I wanted to write this book, because I feel that Blanche and Claude need to be as well known as Coco Chanel. Um, you know what, now I think it's time for us to go have a drink in a famous bar, but before we, have, we do that I need to touch up my lipstick, so come along with me. So this is the bathroom where we actually, of the room where we actually stayed when we visited the Ritz. I just wanted to show you a little bit about, oh gosh, it's just a little bathroom, right? No, I wanted to move in here. It's so much prettier than my house. And you can see maybe, I don't know if you can see in the background, the gold swan taps. Uh, but one thing I wanted to show you is the, the, the lighting here. One of the things that Caesar Ritz really felt very strongly about was that he wanted to make every man and woman who stayed in his hotel look and feel their best. And to that end, he installed lighting that is very, very flattering to everyone. Let me tell you, it's this beautiful peach hue. And I, it really makes you look your best. And I, I looked damn good when I was here. Um, but before we go down and have a drink, I want to tell you a little story about the bar here at the Ritz and one Ernest Hemingway. So Hemingway has a very long uh, association with the, with the Ritz. A lot of this is in my book, but there's been much, much written about it. He famously said, the only reason not to stay at the Ritz when you're in Paris is if you can't afford it. Which is like, duh, of course, Ernest, and most of us can't. But anyway, that's how strongly he loved the Ritz. Um, when the Battle of Paris was won, and the Allies, America, Great Britain, and France, the French troops that had been um, in North Africa during the war came in to liberate Paris. Ernest Hemingway decided he was going to liberate the Ritz all by himself. So he was with the American troops coming into the city. He commandeered a jeep and a 
a couple of soldiers. He said, come on boys, we're going to the Ritz. And they drove through streets that were still full of sniper fire as the Germans were leaving. And they pulled up to the Ritz and Claude Zello met, met him right there in the front hallway. And Ernest Hemingway ran into the hotel with a gun. He said, I am here to liberate the Ritz. The Germans had already left the Ritz. The Ritz did not need to be liberated. But Claude Zello, you know, the consummate hotel man said, by all means, Mr. Hemingway, liberate the Ritz. And so he did. And there took place in the famous Ritz bar, the party to end all parties. Soon Hemingway was there, Marlena Dietrich showed up, all the American journalists like and uh, photographers like Bob Kappa who had not been able to be at the Ritz during the entire occupation. Everyone came home to the Ritz that day and they threw a party in the bar. And I'm telling you this because the bar where they actually had the party is not the bar that is named after Ernest Hemingway. The bar where they had the party was the famous Ritz bar that um, Blanche Azello was the first woman ever to be served in there. And that's where she drank with everybody like Fitzgerald and Picasso and or Hemingway before the war. That's where she had drinks with Goering during the war. Um, and that's where they had the party after the war. Now, the, the women, though, before the 1930s, women were not allowed in that bar which is the reason that they were. Prior to that, there was a little salon across the hall where women would go and have tea and maybe champagne, but they couldn't go in the bar to drink. Well, after Blanche integrated the bar then, I, I'm not really sure what they did with the salon, but at some point along the way, they remodeled, they turned that salon into the famous iconic bar Hemingway at the Hotel Ritz. And on a previous visit to Paris, my husband and I, I decided that I was an author in Paris and I needed to go have a drink at the bar Hemingway. So we got dressed up in our very best clothes and I put on my very best J. Jill dress and we went to the, to the Ritz on a Friday night. And to my great surprise, they actually led us into the hotel to go to the bar because you have to go all the way to the end of the hotel to get to the bar. And so we did. Now the bar is very small and there was not surprisingly a wait to get in and there was a, a doorman bouncer type at the entrance of the bar letting people in and out. Now, my husband and I, despite the fact that we are from the Midwest, we are not rubes. So my husband, knowing the score, and he was, you know, we were dressed up. We were no slouches. He had a suit and a tie on. He went, we were not wearing Prada though, and that may have been our downfall as well, because everybody else was wearing Prada and Chanel and Gucci. Anyway, my, my husband went up to the doorman and he handed him a few euros with a, you know, a wink to let us into the bar when a space opened up and the doorman nodded and he pocketed the euros and then he walked away because it was the end of his shift and he was immediately replaced by another doorman who held his hand out. My husband doesn't like this kind of thing but he looked at me and I looked at him and I had big pleading puppy dog eyes please 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 oh I so wanted to go in there. He handed him some more euros and then we went and we sat and we waited and we waited <laughs> And we waited quite a long time. Well, prettier people who came in after us got to go inside that bar. Well, my husband had about enough of that. He yanked me out of there, but I vowed that one day I would return. So, when we stayed at the Ritz, every evening we got dressed up in our very finest, and this is actually an Eileen Fisher dress, so I had come up in the world. This is the dress I wore at least one night when we were here. Every night we would go to the bar Hemingway when we'd be the first people waiting outside the doors before they opened. And every night we were ushered in. We were the first people in the bar Hemingway. So let's go to the bar Hemingway right now and let's have a drink. Oh, the bar Hemingway at the Hotel Ritz. Yes, this is where we would spend every evening before going out to dinner. This is the famous bar Hemingway. As you can see, there's a lot of Ernest Hemingway in here. It's a very masculine kind of bar, and it's quite small. So every night, my husband and I would come here and have a drink. And every night, we would think about Blanche and Claude Ozello and the others like them, because there were other people who worked at the Ritz during the war who also risked their lives almost every day to work for the resistance as well. And so because they're not remembered here, Every night, I would have a champagne cocktail with a rose. Hey, where's my rose? 
You can't get good help these days, not even at the Ritz. Every night we would have a champ I would have a champagne cocktail. And every night my husband and I would toast to all those who had risked their lives within these very walls. And every night we would toast to Blanche and Claude Ozello. So I would like to toast right now, toast to happy memories of Paris. Toast to better times when we can get back there again. And I'd like to toast to you, all you wonderful readers out there. And I truly hope you enjoy Mistress of the Ritz. And maybe we can all meet for a drink at the Bar of Hemingway sometime soon. Cheers. <laughs>